welcome to the Bunch UK podcast. You're greeted here by Davey, myself, Tony. Hello. Alan. Hello. And Simon. Hello. So, um, why am I here? With you Good guys? question. Good yeah. question. Well, about a year ago, or thereabouts, well, actually probably longer ago than that, on the Ubuntu UK Loco Team mailing list, we've talked about having a podcast in the past, and we've had a number of aborted attempts at making one. And now we're having another one. And now we're having another one, which might actually result in some content. So oh. we've we've got everything in place, an email address, yep. and four microphones. And a website. Yeah, I think that's enough, isn't we're it? We're good to go, yeah. So, Alan, you're, you're, you are involved in the Ubuntu UK community. Yes. And Davey, you are? Uh, yes, I am. Yeah, Simon? Um, yeah. On the periphery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Tony, you're not, are you? No, I have helped out with the Ubuntu UK stand at the Linux Expo. And oh, you did? Yeah, that was good fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm a Ubuntu user. Um, and I'm quite happy to contribute to the discussion as well. Excellent. So, what is this podcast going to bring us today? Um, brainstorm, what that's all about. Fosdem, of course. Yeah, we've got a big package on Fosdem coming up. Swindon's uh, Ubuntu Demo Day in April. And contributions from Yeah, we're going to ask you lot. contributions as well. Sounds like a fun pack show. Now, Alan, you're involved in the Brainstorm project. Now, what is it, for a start? Uh, it's, it's a website, uh, brainstorm.ubuntu.com. Okay. Uh, it was set up by uh, some guys who work in the testing team for Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been live for, what, a couple of weeks now, if that. And it it's modelled on some of the other uh, idea pool and idea storm websites that other companies have had. I know Dell have had an idea storm yeah. site. I think Lenovo have had a kind of more of a blog to kind of gather information from people, from the public about, about various topics. Okay. Um, so this is for Ubuntu ideas? Well... Yeah, it seems that way. It's it's Ubuntu and related stuff uh, ideas. So it's the idea is that um, a member of the public, a user or a potential user of Ubuntu, can go to the Brainstorm website and search for an existing idea that they may already have, like they may want something improved in some way. So, for example, um, they might want um, the webcam support improved in Ubuntu in some particular way. Mm -hmm. So they might search for their webcam and find that nobody else has suggested this. And then they type a little uh, bit of spiel about what they want. That goes into a, a queue with lots of others. And other members of the public can go to the website and rate it up or down. There's little green and red arrows that they can vote it up or down, a bit like Dig. Okay. Yeah, it's filling up with quite a lot of these ideas. There's about three, three or 4,000 ideas in there at the moment. There are a lot of duplicates, and we're trying to clear those up. Um, I was recruited to be a moderator to help them clear out the duplicates. Okay, so anybody can go along. You don't have to be involved in Ubuntu. You don't have to have an Ubuntu login to submit ideas. No, uh, you get a uh, if you if you're a part of the testing team, you'll probably have uh, a login to the QA tracker. But for everyone else, you can just sign into the site at brainstorm.ubuntu.com, register and and start voting things up and down, and start um, registering your own ideas as well. Okay, so what do we think about this idea? There's not too much. There's not just too much. Um, you know, you say you've got 3,000 suggestions on there. Yeah. I mean, are they going to be seriously looked at? Well, the plan is that at the next um, developer summit, um, which is in Prague in May, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, at the developer summit, they're going to go through some of the, probably the highest rated ones over all time and the highest rated ones that month and, and so on, and pick out some of these ideas and see if uh, they have legs, okay. as it yeah. were. Should um, should the guys be focusing on um, these new features that would be great when there are, you know you look at Launchpad there are so many bugs. Yes, good point. Um, but some of them, some of the ideas are actually please pay attention to this bug. You okay. know, it's kind of like a petition in a way to say please draw attention to this thing. And if you get lots of people rating it up, you know, there's an argument that well, yeah, quite a lot of people really do get impacted by that bug. So perhaps we should pay more attention to that. Yeah. And others are conceptual ideas, and and others are well difficult to categorise. But some of them are are quite hard to achieve. You know, there's 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 conceptual ideas like make Ubuntu better as as an idea, or Brilliant. you know, vote down, make it <laughs> make it more like Windows, or make it more like OS ten. And and some of those are right. very hard. You know, you can't just say okay, I'll work on that, making it better than you know OS ten or like Windows. And some people would argue against it anyway and say, I, don't, I wish it wasn't like that. And so some of them are hard to achieve. Can people not make feature requests through Launchpad? Mm -hmm. 
There is a, a, a system called Blueprints in Launchpad right. where you can write a specification, and that's the recommended way to do it. And in fact, building up to um, the Ubuntu Developer Summit, it's a good idea to start now registering Blueprints in Launchpad and requesting that they get discussed at UDS. But the thing I find really good about Brainstorm um, is that some things which you wouldn't consider a bug, you wouldn't consider a feature request, a blueprint. Um, I mean, one, one I'm just looking at now whilst I'm talking is the uh, do not install support for Palm OS devices by default. Now, to me, that's that's a valid point. Uh, I don't own a Palm OS device. Why would I want support for it? Um, but I wouldn't be able to consider that a bug and I wouldn't be able to consider that really a feature request. So, so this brainstorm is actually a really good release for them little niggles that you wouldn't be able to put somewhere else. Yeah, and it also, it's some people find it difficult filing bugs, reporting bugs, whereas the, the free thought way of just brain dumping what you think straight onto a page in a website is easier for a lot of people. I mean, you can see... The popularity of forums, you look at how popular the Ubuntu forums are compared with mailing lists and you know, IRC yeah. and other methods. There clearly is a, a number of people who benefit from feeling that they can release you know, their ideas. In it's way. easy to go onto a website, click up or down. You've not, you know, you've not got a yeah. huge commitment to getting it, there. And it's actually is... quite good fun. It's quite good fun to sit there <laughs> and scroll through you know, what's... There, there was a bit of a problem when it, when it first started in that the day it launched, there were two ideas on the site that were created by the people who created the site. And then the URL got passed around and very quickly it ballooned and it went from two ideas to 10 to 100 in a, space, a short space of time. And those 10 or 100 were on the front page and because they were the first ones you saw and the only ones you saw if you first visited the site people started rating those up because they sounded like a good idea and i'm actually guilty of creating one of the the very early ones and it shows up as most popular on the site not because it's really popular but because it was one of the first ones to be created and it's the one that lots of people have seen which is a bit of a shame so they've tweaked the algorithm and it, it, right. it doesn't show you all time it sh- shows the most popular ones from today by default does it something like that i think it shows uh, most popular ideas this week or uh, most popular today yeah so how many how many plus ratings has, has the top one got what this today week? yeah uh, 100 or so okay and then so a fair number of people must be visiting and clicking yeah i mean it, it, in one day it was on uh, the front page of dig front page of slash dot and the front page of wired and the server kind of collapsed in a bit of a heap. But the canonical system admins who host, or canonical hosts and the system admins look after it, moved it to another server, I believe, which uh, seems to be coping pretty well now. Okay, and, and what are the top three ideas, say? And the top three ideas of all time is uh, fix, suspend, and hibernate. I mean, I don't know anyone who uses laptops here will often find that they break. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a perennial problem, and that's... I mean, it's it's it fair needs to, a lot of focus, really, doesn't it's it? It's fair to argue, and I, I mean, mean if, my, you, if you were to talk to someone like Matthew Garrett about that, I'm sure he'd go off in a rage about you know how difficult it is to just say let's fix that because there are so many problems. Yeah, but I mean, okay, I mean, I've got a, um, a an IBM laptop here. Um, I pressed hibernate, pull it in my bag, and thought it would be switched off. Mm-hmm. It wasn't. I mean, I would have thought this works in Windows. So there must be some sort of stand out there because there's no specific drivers shipped with that. So there, there, there are. Are there? Yeah. That's, that's the problem. Having heard Matthew talk about this, essentially uh, every single laptop does it a slightly different way and every single manufacturer puts different software on your Windows install. Um, to, to make it, to it work. That. Yeah. And that's actually bundled on the Windows disk, is it? Uh, I don't know if it's on the window. It'll be on the, the, the manufacturer's on the utilities on the pre-installed yeah. image. Yeah. I think I recall very recently Matthew Garrett giving a talk for those who don't know, Matthew Garrett is a member of the Ubuntu community, and he's um, very knowledgeable, very knowledgeable about suspend and resume and ACPI and those kind of related mm. issues. And I remember hearing a talk, actually watching a video, so I know it was him saying it, that someone asked the questions, "What should I do if I want suspend and resume?" And the answer was, "If you want reliable suspend and resume, don't use Linux because it doesn't work reliably." So I can see why people have voted that the number one thing on Brainstorm. Okay, what's the next one? The next one is actually one by our co-presenter here, Alan Pope. Oh. <laughs> this is the one that sneaked in at the top because I Provide a simple graphical interface to manage any type of network connection. Okay, so that would be including VPNs, everything. mobile connections. Everything. Because if you look at, like, Network Manager can do wireless, it can do wired networks, and it can do VPN, and I believe it can do dial-up as well. Yeah. And with a bit of monkeying around, you could probably get it to do 3G and 
I don't know if you can, but there's also the connection over Bluetooth to a mobile phone. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's all kinds of different ways of connecting to the internet or connecting to a network. And it would be lovely if there was just a one thing. Like, you know, I hate to say it, but compared with Windows, where there is network places, okay, underneath all of that, there's loads of drivers and applets and, and rubbish. Mm. But there's one place you go to to do dial up networking and maybe not Bluetooth, but most of it is in one place. Yeah. And I think we need a make my network work button kind of thing does it bug anyone else you can't press refresh to actually rescan the wireless networks in the area you have to wait so long sometimes it's quicker just to press reboot and actually have an (laughs) if you have a fast machine yeah yeah it might be quicker to reboot it does take an age for it to refresh i mean if you or you can kill network manager and start doesn't work really if you kill the gui the back end's still running no no no, i meant kill kill the whole thing pseudo capital n network capital m manager i'm pretty sure it start it oh yeah, I just did uh, kill all and an applet, and then no, no, no that's, that's just the just front end. You need to kill the network manager oh, process. Yeah. Capital N, capital M. There's a little bit on the back end that actually oh, does no, the no. scanning. Although I can't say I've had that particular problem. It seems to pick them up quite quickly for me. Or I just go and have a cup of tea and wait until the wireless network. Picks exactly. Up. Reboot. I <laughs> mean, well, yeah, you could do that. Ubuntu helping tea drinkers everywhere. And the third one, power management. Uh, you need Ubuntu needs to go green. Power top, less watts, and other tools have finally hit the Fewer Linux watts. scene. Sorry, <laughs> it's just a knee-jerk reaction when someone says less watts, it's fewer Your watts. watts. Well, <laughs> okay, sorry, I thought I misread it then. Um, now I've completely lost my place. Thank you, Alan. That's right. Um, so it's all about improving the power management. Yeah, basically, it's, it's, what, it's what green hippies want worldwide. They want less power coming out of Linux. Well, it sounds good with the increasing uh, electricity costs. I wouldn't mind some of that myself. I saw a funky uh, uh, fan that attaches onto the heatsink of a CPU. Uh, in a computer recently and it it's um it's driven by uh some kind of convection motor and and so the heat generated by the north bridge or the cpu or something causes this little motor to spin and causes the fan to go around and blow air so you don't need electricity and it seemed kind of like a good idea and then when you think well hang on a minute that's a little five volt fan that draws next to no current. What about the CPU underneath it that's drawing like uh, yeah. 50 watts? <laughs> but look at it this way. You could actually use that power you've generated to run all the LEDs inside your case. Ah, well. There and you have go. a side panel. There yeah, you go. No side panel. Have all the lights. And yeah. Your, your bling bling. <laughs> desk, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's brainstorm then. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've covered that. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys went to Fosdem. Yep, uh, a couple of weekends ago, Dave and I went off with a group from Hampshire, Lug mostly, and uh, yeah, it's a good time. What's FOSDEM then? FOSDEM is the Free and Open Source Developers European Meeting. Developers? So, developers, yeah, primarily developers, although increasingly they they talk about some of the um, sort of related usability and accessibility and things. Well, I wouldn't say it was just for developers either, that, no. it's called FOSDEM, I mean, a lot of the presentations were this is the cool features that are coming. This is what's out there. So a lot of things, it wasn't saying you can help us develop by doing this and, you know, this is what we need. It was just saying, hey, guys, this is what we've got. What do you think? You know. Yeah, so certainly some of the bigger talks as well. But one of the unique things is, and we talk a little bit about this in, in the package, that there are developer rooms where lots of different projects will have uh, either a stream of talks or they will have um, you know, developers talking to each other, deciding how to go forward on a particular project. So in the bigger rooms, yes, it's very much, here's our project and, and doing a presentation to you know, a couple of thousand geeks. Whereas in the smaller rooms, it, it is uh, a little bit more hardcore, if you like. You know, there's, there's coders and they're talking about some of the, the software design choices. So when is it, where is it, and how often is it run? Uh, it's every year. It has been for about eight years. Um, it's usually the last weekend in February, and it's been in the University Libre de Bruxelles in Brussels, um, as far as I'm aware, ever since it started. And you did some recording interviews while you were there? Yeah, yeah. Um, we took along our little recorder, and we spoke to a few people, not people who are necessarily directly involved in Ubuntu, but people who we think that uh, listeners to the podcast might be interested in. Okay, should we have a listen to that? Yep. So we're here on the train to Fosdem, the Eurostar. We've just come out of the tunnel. We're in France right now, and I'm here with Dave and Adrian. Uh, now, I've been to Fosdem. This is my third one, I think. But, Dave, this is your first time, isn't it? Yes, yes, very much so. So, as a Fosdem virgin, what are your hopes for the weekend? I must say, looking at this year's schedule compared to last year's, there's a lot more interesting talks. I don't really know where to start. There's so many clashing... So, Adrian, what advice would you have for Dave as a first-time FOSDEM goer? You've been here for two or three years as well, is that right? Y- yes, this will be the third FOSDEM trip. Um, 
early for sandwiches. They get a bit busier. It is a mad rush at lunch. What about sort of handling the talks? How do you choose what to go to? Um, a dartboard is a traditional way to choose. Um, or a roulette wheel. Um, I've eliminated the ones I'm not interested in, and so that le- leaves me a few left. It, it is quite tricky because there's sort of ten consecutive tracks, at, at least, of speakers and, and uh, sorry, of talks, and they go from the gigantic through to the, the developer rooms where you might have sort of twenty people in. Um, and you can't always tell in advance whether a talk's going to be given well or, or given poorly. And uh, sometimes you end up sort of stuck in a room. Uh, with a talk that turns out to be not exactly what you were thinking it was on in the first place and the speaker is between you and the door and there's not much you can do to get out of it other than sort of smile sweetly and uh, try not to look too conspicuous when you leave. I would say um, it's useful to early on in the talk figure out if you want to stay or not um, in particular what level it's aimed at whether it's an overview introductory talk or an advanced talk which generally you're interested in one or the other but not but uh, and if it's the wrong sort, just leave it early. And so, some of the bigger talks tend to be less in depth and less technical. So the ones in the larger auditoria is often more of an overview. So, so what you're telling me is there's some in depth talks and there's some easy talks. Yeah, the technical the technical complexity <laughs> is inversely proportional to the size of the room. Hi, it's Dave here, and I'm just joining Andrew Woffer from the Bongo Project. Uh, he's the lead developer. Do you just want to say, say hello? Uh, hi. Um, just a quick point. I'm not actually the lead developer. I'm a core cool contributor. Um, but uh, my uh, lead developer would be slightly miffed with me if I didn't say so. Um, basically, Bongo's a, a lightweight email and calendaring solution. Um, it's a nice small footprint memory-wise. There's no Java stack behind it. Um, so don't have time count or anything like that. Um, uh, completely open source, GPL v2 licensed, uh, standards compliant, um, providing uh, IMAP, POP3, email uh, and SMTP, as well as um, a CalDAV uh, calendar client. Um, so hopefully users of any desktop, uh, any OS, uh, should be able to interface with us quite happily and uh, quite pleasantly if they want to use a fat client or uh, use a lovely browser. Now it's got a little bit of a history behind it because it came originally from a closed source product, didn't it, from Novell? Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, our roots trace back ooh, many, many years, possibly around 20 years with Novell uh, NIMS uh, and subsequently Novell Netmail. Uh, Novell then, uh, about three, four years ago, open sourced chunks of Netmail into the uh, Hula project. Um, and for commercial reasons, they uh, then subsequently had to uh, sell off the Hula project to uh, one of their partners. Um, and uh, just before that happened, uh, we uh, thought, well, we like what we've got here. We'll continue it on and uh, create the Bongo project. Well, one thing that particularly interests me, um, when the Hula project uh, come to an end, uh, how did your project actually get off the ground? How did you meet? How did you actually get the project started? Um, the bulk of the... Uh, the guys actually worked on Hula um, as the you know as the project was, and uh, over the last few months of the Hula project, Novell guys just weren't available uh, for whatever reason, um, and uh, there were discussions both on IRC on mailing lists and offline about the progress of things, how to keep things going, um, and there were several people that were championing forking and you know let's just do it our own way kind of thing and we we didn't want to just do it nonchalantly and go right well sodgy novel thank you very much we're going with the code sort of thing um because we wanted to keep things amicable and and whatnot um and you know we held a a debate effectively and a a vote and uh the consensus was indeed to fork um so we tried to do it as um politically polite I think uh, as we could and uh, Novell uh, in all fairness were quite happy with that um, they're quite pleasant and pleased to, to see that we were continuing it as a completely open source project and you know community based and you've got quite a wide range of distros you produce packages for as well I saw in your lightning talk yesterday uh, yeah um, a lot of the RPM based distros are, are supported thanks to uh, OpenSUSE's build service um, we use you know we support packages for OpenSUSE 
Fedora 5.0 right the way through to the Enterprise Edition. Um, we support Fedora 6 to 8, um, Red Hat Enterprise 5, CentOS 5. Uh, we've got Debian packages for Etch out there. Bongo is in Debian Experimental, um, and hopefully it will be in Fedora 9 as well as a uh, you know from their own repositories. Um, and uh, you know we we aim to provide Ubuntu packages as well shortly. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm not very good with Debian uh, based uh, packages, and uh, those that are, are are quite busy at the moment. So it it, it is coming in the short term. You're looking for developers, I assume. Uh, yes, um, developer help would be uh, would be great, but also you know testers, you know just anyone that wants to try it out, file a bug report, you know jump on IRC, the forums, mailing lists, say that I've got a problem, whatever else, can you help? We'll do our best to help. Could be in, you know a new item that we've not encountered because we don't use it in a certain way or whatever else. That would be great, you know, if you're using it with a specific mail client or calendar client, whatever else, let us know how you get on. Uh, all feedback is welcome. But, uh, yeah, some more more fingers on the keyboards would be great. And, and it's a, a mixture of programming language, isn't it? There's, there's C, there's Python, there's JavaScript. Presumably you don't need to be an expert in everything to get involved and help out. No, not at all. Uh, and if you want to learn programming in any of those particular languages, you know, I'm sure we've got a million and one tasks that you know a, a beginner could uh, could help out with. Um, so yeah, there, there's there's lots of jobs that need doing. Some are complex, some are quite, uh, quite lightweight. So yeah. In regards to the interface, um, you said there was a new version. Uh, your interface is called Dragonfly, isn't it? Yeah, currently it's called Dragonfly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what what new um, features will the new interface bring? Is um, apart from nice new look, uh, we're you know, hoping to uh, be able to keep the code base a lot, maintain, a lot more maintainable. Uh, you know, from a developer point of view, but also uh, potentially make it uh, modular and pluggable. Uh, so, if you've got a new feature that you'd like to to have included, um, then you should be able to uh, add that in without too much hassle. And where can people find out more? The website? It's uh, bongo-project.org, and uh, the, there are links there to our forums, our uh, planet. Uh, RC channel uh, it's hashbongo on uh, oftc.net lovely I must say thank you for your time yep thank you very much Andrew thank you hi we're here with Becky Hogg from the Open Rights Group hi Becky hi what is the Open Rights Group okay so the Open Rights Group is a grassroots digital rights organisation so just to translate that a little bit what that means is we speak out every time consumer rights civil rights or human rights are affected by either the poor regulation or the poor implementation of the networked digital technology so we're talking about issues like um, privacy data protection data retention copyright intellectual property software patents electronic voting these are all issues where we've been active on in the last two and a half years we were founded in 2005 and we're sort of special because we exist because a thousand people thought we should in 2005 a thousand individuals said that they would they would um, fund us to five pounds a month each so we're at we're a press clearing house we talk to ministers we also talk to people who are concerned about their digital rights and help let them show them what they can do to, to assert those rights so there's quite a lot in common with the free software community, although it's not something that's inherently tied to, tied to it. That's right. I think um, without the free software community, digital rights issues wouldn't be as high profile as they are. What, I mean, we're here in FOSDEM, and this is the first time I've been to FOSDEM, and I've just met so many engaged individuals from all over Europe. I heard a, a Danish group say today that privacy and freedom are the killer app of free software, and I think, I think that's right. So you're a UK-based group, mm -hmm. but also you deal a lot with Europe and... Well, this is really my first sortie into European legislation right now. Back in 2006, the Open Rights Group uh, ran a campaign against the extension of copyright term on sound recordings. Um, and we managed to, with the help of a lot of other groups and think tanks, persuade the government what you know free software people will, will know all along, which is that copyright doesn't work like that. You don't extend term retrospectively. That's not what it's for. It's it's about incentivizing people to create work and Elvis Presley ain't going to record another track in 1958 if we extend term now. So we, we managed to, um, we, as I say, with the help of lots of other groups, win that argument in the UK and last week the, um, the 
the European Commission announced that they wanted to look into this issue and propose legislation to extend term, at which point I booked a train to Brussels, FOSDEM was going on, I thought I'm going to come down to Brussels, see what's happening and organise a campaign to let the Euro European Commission know what we let the UK know in 2006. So in collaboration with uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation's base here in Europe and also the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco, we've developed a website that we're going to launch um, sometime in the middle of next week but that I'm soft launching here at FOSDEM this weekend. It's called soundcopyright.eu and what it asks is it asks the European Commission, the Parliament and the Council of Ministers, the whole EU shebang, to keep copyright policy sound. Um, so not just on sound recordings but on all copyright policies to make sure that, that policies are made on evidence that all stakeholders' views are taken into account, not just with the recording industry who are desperate, desperate, desperate to keep hold of the Beatles back catalogue and, and rent seek on, on that sort of minority of sound recordings that are still making money now. So that, so I'm getting people, I'm talking to people here, I'm, I'm practicing my schoolgirl French, talking to French activists, I'm talking to some very patient German activists in, in, in English um, and asking them to, to, to sort of take a look at the website, sign the petition and, and get their networks involved in this because this is, you know, we've won the debate in the UK but digital rights organisations across Europe care about these issues and, and, and we want to work in a kind of distributed but collective fashion to, to raise awareness about this over the coming months as the Commission proposal goes through the process. So it, it, the uh, big counter argument is the, the Cliff Richard argument, you know, these, these old singers who lived for so long that they made recordings when they were 18 are now coming out of copyright and it's their, their pension. I mean, so Paul McCartney is going to be needing a few extra quid in the next few years, isn't he? <laughs> That's a very that's a very good point, and yeah, that is the big argument. And in fact, what the pro term extension lobby have done is very clever. They're putting forward the performers, the people who hold performance rights in this music first. And so, if you made a track in 1958, and if you are still that track is being played on the radio, if that track is still being used in movies in advertising, then you are likely to be okay. You're likely to be financially pretty well off. Um, the minority of tracks that are still doing that, they are the ones that are going to get the benefit from this, the people who have been earning money on the records. And that's unlikely to be this um, poor, starving session musician that we, that we hear about. And, and uh, because that poor, starving session musician is poor and starving because for the last 50 years, the music that he made in 1958 hasn't been, you know, giving the returns because maybe people don't like it or maybe it was you know, too experimental for 1958 and whatever. Um, so that argument is kind of a little bogus. Um, the other thing is I think it's great that the European Union and governments want to support um, poor artists. I mean, heaven knows if you choose to make your life out of art, out of cultural production, then you're not, you're, it's not an easy life. It's even harder than, say, being a campaigner. You know, you don't, it's not foie gras and limousines for everybody, right? Um, how, and however, using the copyright system to, to support those artists. It's the wrong mechanism to use. How about reforming the pension scheme? Most of us, we contribute to our pensions during our working life. To say that Cliff Richard needs a pension through the copyright system, I mean, that just doesn't make sense to me. So I don't know if you want to talk about the news that came out last week about the ISPs um, being held uh, criminally sure. responsible. Sure, so recommendation 39 of the Gowers Review of Intellectual Property was that um, inter internet service providers and rights holder groups need to cooperate in order to um, stop illicit file sharing online. And if they don't, then the government should step in in 2008, basically now. So we've seen a couple of proposals come out. We've, keep, we've seen uh, what's called a three strikes proposal. So you have a contract with an internet service provider and the rights holder uh, finds, you know, a Britney Spears track on a peer to peer file sharing network and sees the IP address, um, so, like, grabs a few IP addresses about the people who uploaded that track, finds out who's assigned that IP address, writes to the ISP, sorry, writes to the ISP who's assigned that IP address and says, look, this IP address uploaded content. Um, we want you to stop them because they're breaking your terms and conditions because most people's terms and conditions on their ISP say you can't use this to infringe copyright. So the ISP says, okay, great, looks in their file, says, okay, that's you, all right, I'm going to post you a letter. Or I think it might be an email. It's kind of weird. Um, but it may be a letter and it says, oi, we've had this information. If you don't stop, we'll, t we'll switch off your internet connection. And if they find, you know, and, and they'll, they'll do that three times. And if th after they send you the third letter, they say, right, that's it, sorry, you're cut off the internet. So 
I have problems with that. Do you want to maybe? I jump was going to say, well, thankfully, there's a lot of ISPs in our country. That's right. I mean, and and if if the government really was serious about that, I'd say just cut off people's electricity because it's much harder to get. You know, that would really stop peer-to-peer file sharing, um, and because it's much harder to get another electricity provider. Why doesn't the government do that? Because it's disproportionate. Electricity is um, a universal service, and the government has invested a lot, a lot, a lot of money in making internet for everybody, in putting its government services online. Businesses put their services is online you know this is inc- this is like we even let criminals receive letters in jail right if you cut off someone's internet connection more and more in the east society you're going to be cutting off a lifeline and doing that it just appears to us incredibly disproportionate and i and I also like to ask on one final note um if people like what you're doing how can they help? Yes, thank you very much. God, I'm such a bad salesperson. So I remember, if you remember rightly, I said the Open Rights Group is um, funded by individual UK citizens. If you're not funding us, please do. The website is, H, um, is openrightsgroup.org forward slash support you can find out how to how to how to give us your fiver a month um you can volunteer for us you can join um there's there's a volunteer we have a wiki um open rights group dot org forward slash org wiki um go there there's a volunteer section find out how to join in you can join in even if you're not in london also join the discuss list come and tell us about your ideas about your rights there's a way to join the discuss list on the front page of our website which again is open rights group dot org thanks so much for letting me speak to you today thank you thank you goodbye hi it's dave walker here from the ubuntu uk loco and i'm here with jan kleiss from the ubuntu belgium loco he's the point of contact and um, he's going to tell us a little bit about his logo uh, yeah we have been we have a booth here uh, and there have been a lot of people who are interested in ubuntu we have also sold a bit of uh, posters the Freedom poster, the well-known poster in Dutch, and we uh, helped some p- a couple of people who had problems <laughs> wireless, <laughs> and uh, yeah, many people talking. We have been talking with uh, people from Canonical who were here also. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's been a busy weekend. You know, yeah. lots of people come yeah, by. It's from Friday night to beer event. <laughs> <laughs> It was 3.30 when I left. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how long has the, has the Loco been running in Belgium? Um, exactly two years, because we started two years ago oh, <laughs> at <yeah>. Fosdem. <laughs> oh, cool. And is it a, is it a big team? Um, well, but it's big. <laughs> but we have people who have a core group, and then if we do local activities in, uh, in cities or around the provinces, over uh, everywhere, we have people that we can ask to come there to help like we do a lot of uh, fairs computer fairs uh, sales fair where they uh, second hand computers and uh, cdrs and the cheaps uh, yeah. all this cheap stuff uh, <laughs> yeah we, we have similar sort of fairs yeah we, we go to such fairs to where we also talk to normal people <laughs> about <laughs> ubuntu <laughs> uh, and we can get people from who live not far away from there to to help us i think the core group is maybe 20, maximum 30 people. That's One of the thing that I, things that's just occurred to me is that we have we have uh, tables for things like OpenSUSE and Fedora, but they also have tracks. They have rooms where the speakers are always the talking the about rooms. the same. The dev rooms, yeah. yeah. Um, there isn't any such thing for Ubuntu. I, I wonder if that's something that would be of interest in future years. Well, we, we could try to do something like that. We would have to talk to the Ubuntu developers first if they are interested. But no, the most of the Ubuntu developers are in the Debian dev room, the GNOME dev room, the KDE dev room. So the and I think also... I know a lot of the people who organize for them are also in the <laughs> local team <laughs> of Ubuntu, right. and uh, they, I know from them there are already uh, not enough dev rooms. So if we would want a dev room, we would have to share with someone. Uh, I heard you had some quite large um, meets for, as release parties uh, for, for Gutsy. I, I don't know how, how many there were in the, in the, in the largest uh, release party because it wasn't there that we had like I don't know five, 50 people where uh, where I went which is uh, actually a sort of a luck but a luck that tries to go to the uh, people who are just beginning with uh, Linux so most of the people use Ubuntu <laughs> which is uh, where there are some others who use other distros but it's a Linux bubble Linux chat <laughs> uh, 
where we also did a small release party. There was one in Brussels also, I think, and one in uh, Liège, I think. Yeah, <laughs> they are cooperating for the, the one in, in the largest one in, in Belgium, which we'll know for Hardy will be the only one. Uh, they cooperate with the Dutch one for some like speakers, uh, getting speakers and just. Uh, so it's, it's not just it's not just beer. There's there's um, speakers and talks and things. It's there's some yeah. I just no, this year there were four speakers I think, but otherwise there will be some uh, people will have, uh, get can get help. Uh, there will just be some fun, of course, <laughs> uh, drinks and uh, yeah. yeah, that's really good stuff. Yeah, well, I must say thank you very much for your time, and it sounds like uh, your local is doing really well. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the interview. <laughs> Coming up in um, uh, April, there's an event in... Swindon. Swindon. Yeah. At the, where is it? Museum of Computing um, in the city. 26th of April. Um, and what is it? What's the event? It's an Ubuntu demo day. Oh, cool. Um, What's the plan? What are they doing? I think the plan is just to get people um, to see Ubuntu. Um, lots of advertising going on in the town, uh, in the city, local press. Uh, there was an ad in Linux format, format this month. Oh, wow. Cool. Um, which is good. Uh, really just sort of making the community aware of Ubuntu. Um, I think they're planning to have a big hall filled with monitors, screencasts running, which obviously you know about Al. Um, so hey. tables. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware of their work. Yeah, um, covering all aspects, everything from the absolute beginner. So you don't, you, you know, you don't feel that it's um, Linux. I wouldn't possibly know where to start. It's, it's going to be. It's supposed to be family oriented, isn't it? In in some way. Yeah, the uh, the organizer, um, one of the organizers, Diane's gone out of a way to make sure that um, you know people can bring their families and leave dad uh, to to nerd out whilst they go and <laughs> uh, and, and do things uh, in and around the town. So I think she's put a lot of effort into actually getting it ready. Wow. So, so who has actually been to this uh, Museum of Computing then? I, I haven't. No. No, I, I've, I've heard of it. I've thought about going. You know, it's a little bit out of my way, but... It's about an hour from my place, but... Uh, yeah. So what is it? Is it, uh, as you would expect, lots of glass boxes with old computers in or something? Yeah, too? everything. Loads and loads of old stuff. Wow. Really old stuff. You really can nerd out. Then, yeah, massively. Yeah. Cool. And so who's organising that? Is it Ubuntu UK based it's uh it's Diane. the museum Di- Diane. Uh, of uh, computing in swindon they're actually doing the organizing yeah oh cool that's mm. brilliant yeah they've asked for help on the uh on the ubuntu uk mailing loco mailing list they've asked for help and i know a few people have volunteered to, to go along yep. and um and help out and excellent hopefully excellent. some uh, some of the local lugs as well will will pitch in um there's a couple of groups in and around there's obviously the wiltshire lug um, and there's the Wiltshire Computer User Group. Oh, really? going to be there as well. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Essence, so when's that again? It's on Saturday the 26th of April, and it goes from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Museum of Computing in Swindon. And is there a website? There is. Uh, it's www.museum-of-computing.org.uk. Marvellous. Thank you very much, Dave. Awesome. <laughs> If uh, you've got any feedback for us, then uh, we'd love to hear it. Um, I'll give you the details in just a sec. We'd also be interested in getting recorded material. If you've got uh, tips or reviews or maybe a rant, uh, you can get it down as short as possible, no more than a few minutes, and uh, let us have a copy of it. Uh, Our email address is podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. Or you can come into our IRC channel, which is on the Freenode IRC network, and it's hash ubuntu-uk. Yeah, that sounds good. It'd be great to find out how people are using Ubuntu, what they think of it. Um, if you want to record that on on your system and send it into us, that would be great. Or even just by email would be fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah we'd well, like, uh, yeah, if, uh, if um, audio is a bit too new media, then feel free to just send us plain text emails and uh, we'll uh, maybe read them out on the show or answer them on the show. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's worth yeah. pointing out that we do actually make this whole podcast using Ubuntu. The website is hosted on Ubuntu. Um, the graphics for the website were created in Inkscape on Ubuntu by Dave Murphy. Thank you, oh, Dave. God, yeah, we haven't mentioned his name yet. Oh, yeah. name Dave dropping. Oh, on IRC. Thank yeah. you very much for your hard work. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's fantastic. I love the new logo. It's really good. Well, I say new logo. We never had one previously, <laughs> did we? <laughs> because we didn't there, there exist. There were previous revisions. Yeah, the, the earlier revisions. You don't want to see those. But no, also, he, he turned it around in, what, three days or so, really? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. really hard work. Much appreciated. Yeah, it's really, really cool. Uh, yeah, so everything's done in, uh, in Ubuntu. We're happy about that. It's hosted on Ubuntu as well. Yeah. Uh, and hosted for free. Uh, we've got a free virtual server from Bitfolk. Ah, oh, yes. Thank you, Bitfolk. Thank you. So the next cool. episode, when is that? Well, we're hoping it's going to be in a couple of weeks' time, but we shall see. Yeah, if we get loads of feedback to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org saying, don't, don't bother, don't, bother. <laughs> don't, bother. <laughs> don't make any more of these. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Yeah, <laughs> close the door. Yeah, so that was the worst half hour of my life. Um, yeah, but now, if you've got lots of feedback and suggestions, then we'll be able to put a show together quite quickly. But keep watching the RSS feed, check the website. And, the website uh, is? The website is podcast.ubuntu-uk.org and uh, the email address which Alan's already mentioned but send your tips suggestions and any feedback at all to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org links for everything discussed on the show are of course available on our website so that about wraps it up thanks everybody for listening see you next time yeah thanks very much cheers bye thanks bye, bye.